we are very excited about our Diversity at Broadcom initiative to help foster conversations about diversity and leadership. I really believe that by fostering employee diversity and bringing diverse viewpoints and ideas to the table, we will make Broadcom a better, stronger, and more innovative company. I have seen firsthand the impact Dr. Gina Cody is having in education and the workplace by supporting and speaking out on diversity and inclusion. So I'm so proud to introduce Dr. Cody to the Broadcom team who's joining us here today to share her amazing journey. Dr. Cody came to Montreal as an immigrant from Iran in the late 1970s. She didn't have enough money for tuition, but Concordia gave her a scholarship and she went on to complete her master's and PhD and became the first woman to graduate with a PhD from Concordia's building engineering program. Following her time at Concordia, Dr. Cody joined CCI Group Inc. and helped grow the company into a very successful engineering consulting firm in Canada. Dr. Cody's high standards and relentless work ethic distinguished her first as an excellent engineer and then as a president and principal shareholder of CCI. Under her leadership, CCI was named one of Canada's most profitable companies owned by a woman by Profit Magazine 2010, and Dr. Cody was named one of Canada's top women entrepreneurs. After retiring, Dr. Cody wanted to make a gift to the next generation of engineers, particularly to women and minority engineers. In 2018, Dr. Cody made a very generous donation to Concordia that enabled the university to do many things, including funding research chairs and sponsoring new scholarships and diversity, equity, and inclusivity initiatives. Dr. Cody said that her hope is that there will be so many women in science, engineering, and technology that it becomes the norm. In recognition of her generosity and achievements in her field, Concordia renamed the Faculty of Engineering and Computer Science to the Gina Cody School of Engineering and Computer Science. It is the only engineering school in North America. Let me repeat that. It is the only engineering school in North America to be renamed after a woman and one of the first in the world. Amazing. In 2019, Dr. Cody was awarded the Order of Montreal. And in 2020, she was appointed member of the Order of Canada. While I have shared with you a bit of Dr. Cody's background, Dr. Gori is going to share with you her journey and personal perspective. I hope that you will be as inspired by Dr. Cody as I am. Dr. Cody, thank you for graciously taking the time to meet and talk to the Broadcom team today. We are truly honored to have you join us. Uh, the floor is yours, Dr. Cody. Go ahead. Thank you, Charlie, for your kind introduction. It is such a pleasure to see you again. And thank you for inviting me to speak today. Hello, everyone. It's an honor for me to be here with all of you, even if it is only virtually. One of the silver linings of the pandemic is that it has enabled us to create new and meaningful con connections, no matter where we are in the world. This is the power of technology. And I will be talking more about that shortly. But first, as Charlie mentioned, I would like to start by sharing my personal story with you. I grew up in Iran with three brothers who all became engineers and one sister who became a successful dentist. My drive to rise to the highest academic and professional levels was in large part thanks to my parents. My father owned an all boys high school. He made sure I was always comfortable in traditionally male environment. So during the summers, my father had me teach classes in his high school to boys who were 14 to 16 years old. I remember my father saying to me, if you can handle boys that age, you can handle anyone. And that has certainly proven to be true. 
Like my father, my mother was ahead of her time. She was a homemaker who married young and never finished high school. Yet she understood the importance and value of education, especially for her daughters. I clearly remember her words to me and my sister when we were young. She said, the only way to be independent as women is through education. I've held that board my entire life. As Charlie mentioned, I immigrated to Canada in 1979 during the revolution. I had just completed my undergraduate degree in engineering from the top engineering school in Iran. And my dream was to come to Canada and get my master's and PhD. However, I had only $2,000 in my pocket. My late brother, Mahmoud, had just completed his bachelor's in engineering at Concordia University. I was supposed to be enrolled at another Montreal university, but I had no way of paying my tuition. So he convinced me to meet one of his professors named Cedric Marsh. After one hour meeting with Professor Marsh, he said to me, come to Concordia University. Why would you go anywhere else? We will give you financial support. And that day, Professor Marsh and Concordia changed my life. So don't ever underestimate the power we all have to change someone's life with a simple act of kindness and by listening. Professor Marsh made sure I received financial support and was a mentor to me throughout my entire life as a student and even after. After university, I started working as a tower crane engineer and inspector in Toronto. And gradually climbed the ladder at the company and eventually became the president. For most of my academic experience and professional career, I was often the only woman in the room. I remember attending a conference in Toronto where I was the only woman among 700 attendees. And the MC began his introduction with lady and gentlemen. During my career, I never experienced some of the more blatant forms of discrimination and sexism that many other women have. However, I was always questioned and I always had to prove myself. I knew that to be accepted as an equal, I had to be better than my male counterparts. Many men were expecting me to fail and the failure on my part would only confirm their bias. Luckily, I am a perfectionist and very competitive. I was always prepared. Every meeting I attended, I made sure I read the agenda and did my research. These little details make a big difference. When you are prepared, have the right answers, and know the subject matter, people know this. Because I was often the only woman people were watching me. Rather than focusing on the negative of being under the microscope because of my gender, I chose to see the positive. The advantage it gave me was that everyone knew who I was. All I had to do 
was deliver results. And I did. It's a cliche, but it is true. Always turn a negative into a positive. I quickly worked my way up the corporate ladder until I became the president and principal shareholder of a major Canadian engineering firm. As president, my assistant would often transfer calls to me from men looking to speak to the boss. And when I answered, they would again ask for the boss. And I would reply, I am the boss. Sometimes they still sounded doubtful. Then I would say, look, I have a PhD in building engineering. How can I help you? That almost always got their attention, if not their respect. The point of course, wasn't that they were doubting my education. They were doubting my competency as a woman. For them, women weren't engineers and women weren't the boss. It's one of the reasons why I have spent so much of my time since I sold my company and retired in 2016, trying to close the gender gap in engineering and STEM fields. Because the truth is the world needs women engineers and computer scientists. And perhaps just as importantly, women need women engineers and computer scientists. Here's why. We are in the midst of the fourth industrial revolution. A revolution that relies on skilled workers from the STEM fields, particularly engineers and computer scientists. Engineers and computer scientists, like many of you in attendance, are designing and creating the tools that will shape the world of tomorrow. Your vision and decisions will influence how we will communicate, travel, and live. This is a huge responsibility because we all have a different relationship to technology. Wealth, gender, geography, and cultural traditions all affect access to technology. Yes, technology can connect, bridge divides, and open new lines of communication. Yet it can also restrict and censor. It can create echo chambers and silos of thoughts and ideas. In other words, Technology can empower some and restrict others. And this can be entirely unintentional. As a study published a while ago in the Washington Post and the Guardian found, the safety features in cars are designed for men. This leads to women being nearly 50% more likely to be seriously injured, 50%. And more than 70% more likely to suffer minor injuries in a crash than men. This is true, even though men are more likely to be involved in an accident than women. Why? because cars were designed by men for men from the height of the seatbelts to the positioning and the strength of the airbags. Everything is calibrated for men. Even the crash test dummies are based on the size of the average male. And we all have heard examples of AI taking on the biases of the programmers or 
of learning bad behaviors, as was the case of Tay, Microsoft's failed chatbot. There's also the case of Compass, a computer program used by courts here in the United States to flag defendants who are likely to re-offend. An investigative report by ProPublica found that under this system, Black defendants were wrongly identified at nearly twice the rate of white defendants, making a notoriously discriminatory justice system even more so. A study by the United States National Institute of Standards and Technology found that a majority of face recognition algorithms in use are racist. The study showed that African-American or indigenous faces resulted in much higher false positive matches than Caucasian faces, sometimes by a factor of 10 or 100 times. This matters because law enforcement increasingly relies on this technology to identify criminals or security threats, which means that visible minorities are far more likely to be falsely arrested or detained than white people. Many of these biases and oversights are not int intentional, but as they say, you don't know what you don't know. Engineering teams need to be representative of our society, something that is largely not the case in the United States or in Canada. And the studies on diversity are very clear. Companies that are more diverse, equal, and inclusive are significantly more competitive and profitable. A report by McKinsey and Company found that companies with greater gender diversity in executive positions were up to 21 percent more profitable than their male dominated counterparts. Those companies with greater ethnic diversity were up to 33% more profitable than less diverse competitors. So promoting diversity and equality isn't just morally and ethically right. It's a smart business. So with such significant advantages, why is it difficult to close the gender gap in engineering, for example? According to the Society of Women Engineers, only about 20% of graduates from university engineering programs in the United States are women. And only roughly 14% of working engineers are women. This means the pool is not very large to begin with and it gets rapidly smaller. Why is that? I love a quote I saw recently from Sue Malloy, a fellow Concordia alumna and engineer who was recently featured in our university's top 50 under 50 list. And I'm not sure if this quote originated with her, but she said, sexism is a male dominated field. I could not agree more. The main issue women have entering male dominated fields isn't that there aren't any other women, 
It isn't that women inherently don't have an interest in those fields. The issue is that these environments are often actively hostile to women. Whenever women have trespassed on traditionally male territory, they have been made to feel unwelcome. This often starts when they are still in school. Most engineering professors are older men. And many of them still view engineering as a man's world. When doing the internship in male dominated fields, young women are often not taken seriously. They frequently endure inappropriate comments and behaviors, and in some cases, face open hostility from men. By the time they get their degree, they're already disillusioned. And if they aren't, the same behaviors are waiting for them when they enter the workforce. Is it any wonder that women often choose to change careers rather than face that every day? To change this culture, we need men to have the courage to stand up and be allies to women. And not just the women in their circle of family and friends. This means speaking up. When a colleague says something inappropriate or offensive to or about a woman co-worker. It means speaking up when you notice discriminatory behaviors and practices. It means creating work spaces that are welcoming and inclusive to women. Women don't need a special treatment. We just need a level playing field. Just as men, women need to feel that their work is valued for its merit. Women need the same opportunities for promotion and advancement. And just as men, women need to be respected as professionals. And I want to be clear, this is not an attack on men. Men are just as necessary, valuable, and important to society as women. What I am saying is that men have had a monopoly on almost every field and area of society for most of history. And it is time to give everyone a proportional place at the table. If we want to create a more equal, just and inclusive society, companies and organizations need to make active efforts to adapt and evolve their work cultures to be welcoming to everyone, regardless of gender, race, or sexual orientation. We are facing some of the biggest challenges in history. Climate change and sustainability, a global pandemic, the increasing polarization of our political discourse, mass disinformation and cyber attacks, and the list goes on. If we aren't using our full pool of talent, creativity, and skills to tackle these issues, we are likely going to fail. To use a sports analogy, which I don't often do, it would be like playing for the championship with only half of our team. We are sure to lose. To win, it will take all of us. 
As Gandhi once said, we must be the change we want to see in the world. So don't sit back waiting for change to happen. Be the change maker. Don't underestimate the importance and significance of your role. We still have a long way to go before having a truly equal, diverse and inclusive society. It will take more companies like Broadcom to start the conversation around diversity and inclusion. And thank you for your efforts in this area. This gathering is a testimony of your will and desire for a more inclusive and diverse society. And I know we will get there, but we must do this together. Thank you.